Hi everybody, it's Tamara from Moogly and I am coming to you today live here on YouTube to answer your questions. So I am going to kind of yammer at you here for a hot minute while we wait for the video to load so I can see your comments and make sure my volume is turned off. And there we go, just like that. It actually worked quickly today. Usually that takes a little bit longer. So hi again. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is March 11th, 2020. So I was just on Facebook Live about a half hour or so ago, and I was showing off the last two weeks of projects, giving some sneak peeks, talking about the giveaways going on on Moogly. Um, I know you don't see all that here on YouTube, so if you would go to the link in the description or just go to mooglyblog.com right now, the top post has all the links for everything I talked about this morning on Facebook, and you'll want to check it out because there is a new video tutorial coming out tomorrow for this super cute guy. Let me show you here. This is the octopus squish. So cute, got little tentacles and everything. So this video tutorial will be out tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. And of course, there's, like I say, there's giveaways going on all the time. Right now there's a yarn giveaway. There is, oh gosh, what else am I giving away? A pair of socks, a crochet hook. Um, they're fun socks, they're crochet themed socks, not just like random like pair of like Hanes. Um, <laughs> but I'm also giving away this Knitter's Pride Signature uh, yarn dispenser. Long name, great product, spins your uh, skeins of yarn so you can pull from the outside if you don't want to pull from the center, nice and smooth, keeps it from flopping all over your table, or the floor, or the couch, um, getting that pet hair and dust, which, you know, I'm sure it's only my home that's covered in those things, but you know, just in case. It's a fun giveaway. That one's open worldwide. Like I said, the other one's worldwide. The yarn one isn't worldwide, but definitely if you're in the US or Canada, be sure to enter that one. Um, definitely check it out. Lots of fun happening. So if you are watching, oh, hi, Chris. I was about to say, if you are watching, please let me know. Say hi. Let me know uh, that I'm not just talking to myself out here in the void. Um, so anyway, like I said, go to the link in the description for everything I talked about this morning. Um, all the giveaways, the latest projects are there. Um, the Moogly Crochet Along Square, which is really gorgeous. The last one we did was number five. It was designed by Polly Plum. Fantastic design. I was just um, here in the few minutes between the lives over in the Moogly community group on Facebook, or excuse me, the Moogly Afghan group on Facebook, the Afghan Crochet Long group. And so many people have finished square number five, and it's absolutely stunning in all their different colorways. Lots of color inspiration there. If you're interested in making a 12-inch square by itself or joining the Crochet Along, check that out. Great way to see how the squares work up in different colors and get help if you need it. Although I will say this last one, not seeing a whole lot of questions for it. It must be a pretty easy one. It's entertaining. It's not easy but it is really well written and I hope you'll enjoy it. So do check that out. So hi everybody. I see you've got some more of watchers. Heather, Peggy, Brenda, bless by God. Oh, bless by God. I'm guessing that's, I had to say that one out loud. Uh, Jelly Bean, Catherine, Teresa, The Crochet Clogger, Nicole. Thank you so much for tuning in, you guys. I'm so glad you're here. So now, as I was saying last month, now that I'm going live twice a month here on YouTube, the first one, um, the first live of the month here on YouTube, I'm going to be answering your questions live. Uh, so last month I did this and I got a few more questions in the comments that I've written down. I also got some questions from you guys in the Moogly community group on Facebook. So again, that's another great reason to join that group. Uh, it's great for showing off your things you've made from Moogly patterns, getting help if you need it with a pattern, uh, since it's likely someone else there has made it. And of course, um, I'll put special things in there, like a call for questions for things like this. And then of course, that's why I've got these comments up so I can try and answer your questions live as well. So hi again, thanks for tuning in. Let's get right to it. The first question I had today comes from Pinky Swear Fiber Art, and she asks, New, kn new knitter, any advice on how I can tell while doing the seed stitch if I'm on a knit or a purl? I have a horrible memory and it's making it challenging for me. I am a crocheter. If I know what I'm looking at, it would help. Any suggestions would be great. So I have put together a small swatch. We're going to come on down here to the table, hopefully. There we go. Awesome. That worked. Always good when things work, right? So here I've got a small swatch. Sorry, these needles are so loud. I had to find some big needles for this yarn, but I wanted to make sure you guys could see what you see what's going on. So here I have a small swatch of seed stitch that I've worked up using Bernat Maker Big. Um, nice big yarn so you can really see the stitches. And what the seed stitch is, for those who don't know, is basically knit pearl knit, or well, in this case, you can see here, it's a pearl knit, pearl knit, pearl knit, pearl if you know how to read your stitches. 
But that's the way the pattern's formed. You have knits and purls alternating, and then when you turn to the other side, you knit your purls and purl your knits. So it creates us a really similar look actually to the moss stitch in crochet. But if you are not familiar with knitting, if you're a new knitter, being able to read your work, just like being able to read your work with crochet, can be really difficult. So I wanted to take a moment to really talk about how these stitches look and how they're formed. So um, let's go ahead and turn back here to the working side. And basically, I'm going to get my yarn back here. This yarn is so thick, I was going to try and knit it continental, but I can't. I'm going to have to throw it. So we're going to knit our first stitch. And when you knit, when you yarn over with that bit of yarn that you're yarning over and pulling through, you can see the loop from the previous stitch, the one we worked into, goes to the back of the stitch. Okay. Now when we purl with the yarn in front, we insert our hook or our needle. <laughs> That's what used to saying hook. Insert our needle there in the front and yarn over and pull that loop through. Now as I do that, the needle, the stitch that we worked into that's on the needle, as we pull that off, that goes to the front of the stitch right there. Now it's in front of our stitch. So let's do that again a couple times. We're going to knit the next stitch here. I'm going to go in, yarn over, and when I pull that through, that loop falls to the back of our work, like so. And then when I purl, I'm going to yarn over and pull that loop through and the loop on the needle goes to the front. So that is our clue on how to read these stitches. If I pull this up sort of nice and high here so you can see it, you can see right here, see how this loop that it's on my needle comes up out of a V? That's a knit because the previous stitch fell to the back. The next one, I've got a loop right across the base of the stitch that's on the needle that's a purl because you can see on the back where it looks like a knit on that side here it's a purl because that loop is in front so here we've got another knit and then of course I just made another purl so that's how you what you want to look for to be able to read your stitches now obviously the smaller the yarn the fuzzier the harder this is going to be able to see so a little tip unless you need to work a specific number of stitches for a pattern if you're just working up a seed stitch dishcloth or washcloth or something like that, is to always work an odd number of stitches. And that's what I've done here, and I'm going to go ahead and show you why. You can see here, I started with a knit, purl, knit, purl. So now it is time to knit again. So I will knit, purl, and knit that last stitch like so. Now, when I would, oops, <laughs> this is a loud needle, isn't it? Oops. When I turn to go back the other way, I am supposed to knit my purls and purl my knits. Well, on this side, we know we started knit, purl, knit, purl, knit, purl, knit. But from this side, this looks like a purl. So again, it would be knit, purl, knit, purl, knit, purl, knit. So if you're working back and forth in rows with seed stitch and you have an odd number of stitches, you can remember you always start with a knit stitch or always start with a purl stitch. Which one you start with is going to be up to you. But you'll always, if you start and end with that same stitch, then you'll be able to work it the exact same way on the other side. So just a little tip, if you're a beginner and you're having trouble reading your stitches, but you really want to practice them, the seed stitch is a great way to practice knitting and purling, especially uh, if you are knitting continental. Um, great way to get used to moving your yarn back and forth. Like I say, this yarn was a little thick for it. But if you work that odd number of stitches, that will let you know you can always start with the same stitch and you're always going to be fine that way too. Otherwise, you just really want to pull down on that previous row, <clears throat> excuse me, pull down on that previous row and look to see how the stitch on your needle is coming up out of the stitch previous. Is the stitch previous open like a V? That means it's a knit. Is there a line over the base of that stitch, a loop? That means it's a purl. So that is my best tip for the seed stitch in knitting. All right, so now let's go to our next question. Uh, we have a question from Tiffany Smith. She says, I'm looking for a mile a minute tutorial. Do you have one? I don't have one as such. Now, mile a minute is a tricky term. Um, just like everything else in crochet, you know, it can be really, um, I don't, I don't want to say vague, but it can be, it's a little squishy. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Um, mile a minute can be done a couple different ways, 
but the most common way to do it is basically with the granny stitch. And for those who aren't familiar, my laminate afghans are afghans made where you make a long strip, and then as you come around, you actually join the strips together. Um, it's kind of hard to picture. I don't have an example of, of it in front of me because I never actually made one. Um, I'm familiar with the technique, but I will say, uh, so I don't have a tutorial for it. But the one I would recommend is by Bob Wilson 123 She's got a great YouTube channel, fantastic crochet YouTube channel. And um, she's got a great tutorial for the Mile a Minute uh, join if you want to check that out. So I would recommend her work on that one. Maybe someday I'll design one. Um, it's a really great technique. If you like making blankets and you like to see them come together really quickly, it's a fun one to check out. So do check that out if you're not familiar with Mile a Minute. If you're looking for a tutorial for the join, check out Bob Wilson 123 Can't recommend that one enough. So then the next question is from Kelly Farmer, who says, Hi, I'm currently making a Marley Bird pattern beginner throw, and the amount of stitches in the foundation row is 82. I have no idea what pattern this is, but okay. And I've done so many rows with treble, treble crochet in UK terms. How can I adjust the length so it's wider? Okay, great question. Um, now, it doesn't matter, obviously, how many stitches you have. In particular, UK terms, treble crochet is the same as US double crochet, just to clear that up for anybody who didn't know. Um, but the technique's going to be the same if you need to add a section of stitches along the side of your work. Now, uh, let's, for example, let's say you've got 82 stitches wide. You really, to make the project work, needed 84, 86, 90, whatever it is. But you've made so many rows that you really, really don't want to have to go back and frog it. I get it. If it's a small swatch, I'd say just pull it out, sorry, start over. But if you're halfway through a blanket, you don't want to do that. Um, so there is a technique that you can use to work on that. So let's check it out here. Oops, I keep putting my list down on top of my computer and then it's making it act up. So if we come back down here to the table and get these loud needles off this table here so they stop making so much noise. I've got some Bernat blanket here in two different colors. And obviously normally you would be doing this uh, most likely in just one color, not in two, but I wanted to be able to make sure you could see the stitches. So like I said, for this technique, adding more stitches along the side here, uh, if you obviously had to swatch this side, I'd be like, too bad, so sad, pull it out and start over. But if you have a great big thing and you wanna add some stitches to, here is how I would do it. You would find the last stitch on the side you wanted to add to, for the sake of just going on, we're gonna add them to this side here. And I'm going to go ahead and put my hook right in the bottom of that foundation chain, okay? So right where we were working in for those stitches. I like to work into that third loop, so my foundation chain has two loops down here, uh, but it might be just going under one depending on how you made yours. So let me find the end of the other color here, which I've pulled up into a big mass. Always fun to find the end of the yarn. There we go, okay, and a hair. Always gotta have a hair too, right? Okay, so we've got our hook in that last foundation chain. What I'm going to do is, oh, and my computer wants to restart now. Not right now, remind me tomorrow. There we go. I'm going to pull that loop right through the base of that foundation chain. Find my working end here, not my end end. And then I'm just going to go ahead and chain however many more stitches I need. So let's say I needed three more stitches. I've got three more chains right there. Then I'm going to, it depends on what stitches you're making. If you're making double crochets, you might wanna chain two for that. However you're making your double crochets, chain three instead. I'm just going to say, for the sake of time, we're gonna chain two and not count those as a stitch. Sorry, I have a hair on my hand that won't come off. It's driving me bonkers, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna yarn over, I'm gonna go into the third chain for my hook. Again, this just depends on what kind of stitches you're making. Because I need to make up three stitches for our arbitrary little swatch here. So however you wanna work into those stitches, go on into those and make, or into those chains, make those three stitches, like so. And then you can see it's kind of upside down. I'm gonna go ahead and flip my swatch over now we've come back, so I'm going to slip stitch into the top of that row. Remember we joined to that uh, foundation chain at the bottom of it. Now I wanna slip stitch right into the top of it, like so. And I wanna go ahead, I'm not going to work into this slip stitch or anything like that, so I wanna go ahead and pull that one in relatively tight. Then I can chain two again, or whatever is needed to uh, make that next row. I am going to slip stitch into the top of this next stitch right here to join to the top of the next row. 
So you can see we've worked our first row by chaining out from the base, working back across, slip, slip stitch to the top of that row, chain up as needed, depending on the height of your stitch, to get to the top of that next row, slip stitch into there, and then you can turn and just work into each of those new stitches you made. In this case, again, we're making double crochets. It could be any stitch. So there's two. Whoops, let me try that again. Dropped it right off my hook because I glanced over to look at the questions. There we go, and three. Okay, so now we've added two rows of three stitches each, like so. And it needs a little bit of blocking. You know, you can kind of zhuzh it a little bit here with this bigger yarn. Of course, it's going to be a little bit bulkier. You can see it's blending right in otherwise, especially if it had been the same color. So to make the next row, chain two or again, whatever you need for that height. Now work into those new stitches again. We're going to add our three stitches here. And then I think I might be at the top of the little swatch I made. But you could absolutely just keep going. Here we are again. So I would just slip stitch in the top of that next stitch here. Pull that around, there we go, like so. And then chain up again as necessary. So that is how I would add if you got somewhere, you were too far into your work to frog it, but you needed to add a few more stitches to the side, that is the easiest technique I can recommend. Um, again, it can work with any stitch, you just need to be able to chain up to get that height for your stitch before you slip stitch in and work back and forth out from there. So I hope that um, I hope that's helpful for uh, Tiffany and, or excuse me, for Kelly Farmer and for anybody else who has that question and needs to add just those few extra stitches over there. So I'm going to come back here to our questions real quick here and let's see. Um, it looks like there's a discussion. Uh, the YouTube channel that I recommended for the mile a minute, uh, Tiffany Smith, I see that you're here, which is awesome, is Bob Wilson 123. Absolutely fantastic. Um, if you type in Bob Wilson 123, um, all is one word. And here on YouTube and My Limit, I believe it should come right up. It did for me, certainly. So good morning. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm just checking to see if we have any other questions. Hello, hello, Francis and Kelly and Martha and Anne and Karen and of course Tiffany Smith who sent in a question, which is fantastic. Chris is recommending that both Annie's and Leisure Arts have some great Mile a Minute books. Absolutely true. Fantastic. Um, Cindy Caldwell asks, do you have a recommendation for a good use for seven skeins of Noro recycled silk yarn fingering weight? I have not worked with that one myself, although I know Noro has really, really gorgeous colors. Um, so I don't know how much yardage seven skeins represents, but it sounds like a lot. Um, something like that in fingering weight, I think. Um, and if it's Noro recycled silk, my best recommendation for a yarn like that would be like a wrap or a shawl. Um, recycled silk, again, I'm not familiar with this one in particular, but it tends to have um, a lot of surface texture, um, which you may or may not want to wear, wear directly on the skin, um, especially in more sensitive areas. Um, so I think something, you know, an overgarment, like a wrap, uh, rectangular, triangular, crescent, whatever shape floats your boat. Um, I think that would be really lovely. And those recycled silks have such beautiful, gorgeous colors. Um, the beautiful open lacier shawl stitches are a really great way to show that off. So off the top of my head without seeing the yarn, that would be my best recommendation. And of course, I don't really know what kind of projects you like to make. Um, but to me, I think that's what that yarn would call me to make. So my best guess. So, hi, Tanya from Colorado. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bob Wilson123, thank you, Chris, for adding that. Uh, Jen, Jen Deal, sorry, uh, said, I was always told silk is best to knit and not crochet. Um, I mean, you know, if you can do both, I would say work up a swatch in both and see what you like best. Um, obviously, if you only currently have one skill, go with the one you know. Um, I think the great thing about crochet is that you can do it with just about anything. I've seen crochet with plastic bags, of course. We're all familiar with Plarn. Um, I've even see, seen people crocheting with VH, uh, VCR tape, you know, the, the old cassette tape. You can do stuff with that if you've got some of those laying around you don't know what to do with. Um, so I'm sure you can crochet with it, um, but if you've got both skills, why not? Try it up. Work up a swatch in both and see what you like best. Um, 1,600 yards, that in fingering? That should make a good size shawl um, for sure. So hi from Brazil, Alameda. 
Uh, Margaret, do I crochet both left and right handed? I do not. I crochet right handed. Uh, my lovely husband, Jeff, who is behind the camera, he has all the technological skills to flip the videos for us. I wish I could crochet left handed. That would be super handy when I teach in person. Um, but alas, I'm as limited as anybody else in that one. I just happen to have someone who knows how to work the technology to flip the videos for us. So it works, right? It, it works and it all works out. So uh, we've got Mary Gray. She said she got what her question was. So that's awesome. Hi from Utah to Margaret. And Cindy, you can knit, crochet, Tunisian, nook, and learning to tat soon. Oh my gosh, you've got so many options. It's almost too hard to talk about. Um, so you can do anything. I would, I think that would be lovely. Tunisian is definitely hot right now. Um, it's having a moment. Um, as for tatting, I have seen beautiful examples of it. I don't know how to do it myself. I've got a vague idea. It looks really complicated, kind of uh, like old-fashioned lace knitting almost, or lace making with all the bobbins and things. Um, although I think, from what I understand, tatting is just one shuttle. It's it's a skill I'd like to learn someday, but I don't have it yet. So that's awesome. I think you've got a ton of great options for that yarn. Uh, Nancy Ibarra asks, do you have a video on combining the two Moroccan basket pieces? Uh, the video we have is using two yarns at the same time. Okay, this. Okay. Um, Okay, so I do have videos for round seven. Uh, I didn't make a full tutorial for that basket because at the time I wasn't making full videos. It just wasn't, um, it wasn't something we were doing as a business. Um, if I were to go back now, obviously I would redo that one. Unfortunately, I cannot because I'm with a different yarn company. I do have video tutorials for working the Moroccan tile stitch in the round, which after that round seven, around eight or wherever it is you're making that transition to the pattern it's worked the standard way the way it's shown in all my other videos um so there are other video tutorials for that linked in the pattern i'm sorry i don't have a more complete one for that uh it's one of those things in retrospect i would have done um but unfortunately right now that ship has sailed so uh let's see let's go back to our questions from before i have um, a couple more questions and i have a really great tip that i want to make sure to share with you guys that i actually um kind of had a just a a moment this week um, about so I'm going to share that with you here at the end uh, but the next question is from Chris Lopez who I know is here uh, Chris asks what is your favorite thing you ever designed and why okay um, this was hard because I had to go back I realized I've got well over 400 I think 450 plus patterns at this point um, you know a lot of them were free on my blog some of them have been in magazines and of course I've got my book quick crochet for the home available on Amazon um, so uh, gosh, I really had to think back, and I think ultimately my favorite pattern still, it's an older one, it's been out for years, but I love the Artfully Simple Infinity Scarf. And we tried to get a picture here to put up on screen. I'm going to see if it works. Jeff's been working on it here. There we go. Hopefully that shows up nice and clear. Um, that is the Artfully Simple Infinity Scarf, and it is made uh, originally with one skein of Red Heart Unforgettable, which is a really, really gorgeous roving style yarn. And I picked up, you can see I didn't even have my logo back then when I designed this. I had to just put my website on there as my watermark. Um, this is such a simple pattern. It's just chains and double crochets. And the reason I love this is because it creates a really beautiful wearable piece with one skein of yarn. And while I use Red Heart Unforgettable, I have seen it in a variety of other yarns, all gorgeous. Doesn't really even matter hook size, yarn size. You pair them together to get the look you like and you just start going. I remember I sat down with this skein of yarn one evening at a friend's house, and I knew I wanted to make something with it, but I had no idea what. And I just started playing around with it. And I don't even know, two hours later, if that, I had finished this scarf. And it has always been a hit for me. Um, it was very popular when it first came out, and I still get people sending me pictures and telling me how much they love it and how many of them they've made. So I hope you guys will check it out. I'm going to have to go back. Um, I hadn't hadn't looked at these uh, questions until a couple days ago, so I need to add that link to, uh, I'm taking a note right now, I'm going to add that link to the link in the description so you guys can go straight to that one too. Uh, but if you ever type in Moogly blog, Artfully Simple Infinity Scarf, it should come right up. Uh, the other fun thing about that pattern is that I designed that one. It is an infinity scarf, so it's all sort of a circular round piece. Um, I did design later than a companion piece, the Artfully Simple Angled Scarf, which actually is um, open. It's an open scarf rather than an infinity scarf, and it has angled ends that so keeps that stitch pattern. Uh, so another fun way to work with that. So that is probably my favorite of all time, just because I think 
So many new crocheters have found success with it. And because it changes so much depending on the yarn that's used, everyone is really unique and different and lovely in its own way. And um, it's just a lot of fun. It can be worn in a lot of different ways too, which you'll see if you go to the description, uh, or the, rather the pattern link, which I will get at the link in the description here as soon as I get offline with you guys. So let's see. Um, I'm glad you guys like it. Thank you so much. Uh, Margaret Simon has a question. Let me scroll up a little bit. It's trying to go away from me. Uh, I want to make a hat, and the pattern calls for red heart gemstone yarn. Is it fine to use red heart with love? Is the weight or texture completely different, or is it just a color? Uh, gemstone is... Um, trying to think. It's... I mean, it's certainly a different color. Let me... I think I have a skein of it right here behind me, so let me grab that real quick. Oh, oh sorry. I'm going to bump everything. The chair is kind of stuck to the table here. Or to the rug rather there we go okay here is my skein of red heart gemstone i used this yarn to make the um smokestack hat and cowl and boot cuffs and i've had a request for fingering uh gloves i don't know if those will come out yet this spring or not uh this one is a five bulky weight um now officially that is heavier than red heart with love but if i hold it up here to the camera I think to me that look doesn't look a whole lot heavier than with love to be honest and with love is certainly um, a heavier Aran weight so it's I'd say at the top end of the fours let me see I'm trying to look around and see if I've got anything with with love laying around in front of me unfortunately I don't to hold them up and compare I would say go ahead and try it with with love and um, see if you can get gauge if you can get gauge and the fabric still looks good to you then I think you're good to go this one seems to be um, on the lower end of bulky I would say depending on how you know depending on what hook size you're using with it so I would say go ahead and give it a try try it with the with love and see if it works up um, like I say it's mostly about getting the gauge if it is a hat you'll want it to fit so if you can get that gauge change the hook size if you need to but you should be okay after that so I think that would be alright I think that would be a decent substitution so let's see, um, looking for more questions. Linda Leishall asks, how did you come up with the name Moogly? Great question. Basically, um, when I decided I wanted to start a blog way back in, oh gosh, I think this probably would have been 2007, 2008, 2009, way, way back then, um, my kids were very small and I knew I wanted to start some sort of blog or something and I didn't know exactly what about and at the time mommy blogging was very very big so I thought well I've got these little kids I think I'm funny I'll try and start a mommy blog didn't really work um, I didn't f I found that it, words didn't really flow for me I didn't have a whole lot much to say about it other than Ugh, what a day you know or maybe my kid did something funny but it just it wasn't flowing it wasn't working for me uh, but while I was writing that I had written up a couple of quick crochet patterns and posted them um, because it was just a hobby of mine and I decided to just write about whatever I was doing. And um, the patterns actually did better than the rest of the blog. They were the only thing people were coming to the blog for. And I wasn't really writing on it anymore. And then that sat for about two or three years. And I didn't do anything with it at all. Uh, the patterns were out on Ravelry. They were just kind of sitting there. Sometimes people were making them. Sometimes they weren't. And then um, we got to the point where my youngest was getting ready to go to preschool. And um, it was time to revamp it. So, and it was time to start something new. And I decided, you know what? The crochet is doing well. Let's go all in on it. So I went back to the old blog and rather than starting over again, I just stripped off everything that wasn't crochet related, kept the crochet content and went from there. So originally Moogly was a mommy blog. And the reason I called it Moogly was because that was a word my daughter had come up with when she was about two. She's now about 18 and a half. <laughs> So when she was about, I don't know, maybe one or two years old, she was walking on, you know, one of those wobbly things. You know, kids always find something wobbly to walk on, whether it's, you know, a piece of board or a parking divider or whatever. She was walking on something. And I remember she just said, oh, it's so moogly. And Jeff and I both stopped and we're like, what, moogly, what are you talking about? And she's like, it's so moogly. It goes back and forth. It's moogly. And we just thought that was the funniest word. Um, she used it anytime she was talking about anything wobbly or insecure. Oh, it was just such a good memory. So when I went to name the the mommy blog, I went with Moogly because I didn't know what I was doing. 
And when I relaunched it as a crochet blog, I kept it because I still didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had never designed professionally, quote unquote. You know, I had thrown out a couple little like dishcloth type things. Um, but uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I felt really unsteady. I felt wobbly. And uh, so we just went with it. We kept it as Moogly, sort of an homage to my daughter who has now modeled many of my designs as well as my son's. Um, so it's sort of a family word that stuck. And there it is. <laughs> it's not really, it, it breaks all the rules. Every, whenever you're starting like a crochet business, all the experts are always like, you know, make sure it says crochet, make sure your business name indicates what you do. Moogly does none of that. It totally breaks the rules, but there it is. So we went with it. So let's see here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, let's see. Nicole Lindsay. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed the Artfully Simple Infinity Scarf. Thank you. And let's see. Uh, Amaris Joseph asks how to set up a crochet portfolio. Hmm. I'm not sure what you mean by a crochet portfolio, to be totally honest. Um, portfolio. I'm not sure how you mean to use that word in this one. Um, set up a crochet portfolio. Set up a crochet blog. That's a topic. That's a long topic. I would say um, I get do get asked that all the time. My best advice if you're looking to set up a crochet blog or any blog is to uh, pick a platform. I like WordPress. Uh, different people like different ones. Wix is popular. Uh, if you really just want to get started, I do recommend if you intend to blog for profit that you used WordPress because it works really well with the different advertising platforms out there. And of course, that's how bloggers make money. Uh, so that's important. Um, but in terms of setting up a crochet portfolio, if you just want to keep track of your stuff, um, I know it's controversial. I love Ravelry because they've got that notebook feature. It's just so great and easy. Um, other than that, I'm, sh I'm sorry. I'll have to ask for more clarification if you're still here on what you mean by that. So let's see. Um, let's see. Thank you. I'm glad you guys enjoyed the story. Chris asks, is the octopus just a visual of a kind of being moogly? Um, yes, definitely. That's part of it for sure. But actually, um, when I did relaunch as a crochet blog, um, I kind of skipped over this part. Initially, yes, I had a couple designs on the site. Um, but my goal, my initial goal was like many people to sell the finished items. Um, so I was using the blog to talk about like, oh, this is what I made for, you know, this client. Would you like one too? Um, look, I whipped this up. Would you like one? So that's, a, that's what a lot of the first posts are. Um, and one of my most popular products that I sold a finished item was, of was a Kraken style or an octopus style hat, sort of a hood with the tentacles that came down. Um, very different from the cute little guy I just designed for last week. Uh, but it was very popular and I needed a logo to put on Facebook to start the Facebook page. I had to have something. I didn't want just that blank. And at the time, this was, oh my gosh, it feels like the dark ages now, 2011. Um, way back then, people were still trying to be uh, a little bit more private, I guess, online. And so I didn't want to put up my face up there. I wasn't ready for that yet. Um, so I needed a logo. So I took a picture that I had of the hat I'd made um, that I thought was just kind of really cool and graphic. And I ran it through an online graphics program. So it just sort of made the outline of it. And I threw it up there as my logo. So I used that for the first at least year or so. And when it came time to get a quote unquote real logo made, you know, by a real professional, um, I asked my audience, you know, of like a whopping like a thousand people at the time, which was awesome. And the main feedback I got was don't get rid of the octopus, keep the octopus. Um, and I've always loved octopuses. That's one of the reasons I loved making that project to sell the finished item of. Um, I've always felt really drawn to octopuses. Ironic because I cannot swim. Uh, not a bit. I will drown. If you put me in the ocean, I'm done. I will be down there with them. Um, but I've always loved them. And I love the visual of juggling all the different things. I always say, you know, I'm a blogger. I'm a designer. I'm an author. I'm a writer. I'm a mom. Um, I'm a wife. I'm a friend. We all are. We all have all those different things we're juggling in our daily lives. And it can feel a little bit like being an octopus. Um, you know, you've just got all those tentacles juggling all the different things, trying to make it all work, trying to make it all balance. Um, the neat thing about an octopus, of course, is that their brain is sort of distributed through their tentacles. They've got like eight little brains independently handling all, handling all that stuff, which sometimes I wish I had. Um, but yeah, so I think for me, I don't know, it's kind of a weird, it's not really a direct line between, I know, the octopus and crochet or crafting, but it sort of symbolizes where my head's at and uh, also one of the big things that really got Moogly going. So that's why the octopus. So hi, Nancy. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. I'm so glad. Nicole wants to know, how can you someone break into being a crochet tester? Another great question. 
Um, there are groups, again, on Ravelry. Uh, if you go to the forums, you can look for crochet testers. There's groups there. Um, some designers run their own groups. Um, like I know Marley Bird has one uh, that she runs for testers. But I know a lot of designers will go to Ravelry to go to that testing group to start finding people to start testing their own designs. Um, another option is if there's a designer you love, approach them and say, hey, I would love to be a tester. I know it's something... Uh, like I said, my friend Marley Bird runs a testing group on Facebook, and it's something I've been debating, especially as I do get into more garments and things that are sized. Um, you know, something like this. Pretty simple. Probably doesn't need a tester. Uh, but, you know, a sweater in nine sizes, obviously I'm not making all nine sizes. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I don't think you do either. Um, so, yeah, just talk to a designer and say, hey, I would love to test for you sometime if they've got a testing group. Um, they'll probably put you in it or run you through ever what their vetting process is. Um, everybody handles that one a little bit differently. Uh, but if you are on Ravelry, I would say look for that forum and maybe start there. Uh, they'd probably have more information for you there. I've never tested professionally myself, so, but I know it's a possibility. So, all right, let's see. It looks like we're all caught up there, I hope. If I missed your question, I apologize. Please do put it in again. Um, I have one more question that was sent in previously from Carol Hayes, who says, what's your method for organizing all your yarn? Well, that is a big task. I'm not going to lie. It is a big job. Job. I have a lot of yarn, um, and you can see just a little bit of it behind me. Um, the wall behind me, you can see it's a section of three. There's another section of three here, right here, then a, um, another section beyond that of another set of three. These go six cubes high, and then there's actually a double side. They're double back. There's a whole other set on the back side, so I have to walk around this wall to get to the second half of my yarn. Um, so basically how I organize it is in these cubes. Um, I got these at my local Home Depot. Um, they're also available online. There's a couple different brands um, that Cubicles makes them. Uh, I think when I got these originally, it was a Martha Stewart brand being sold at uh, Home Depot. Uh, I'm a huge fan of those because I like being able to see my yarn because I am constantly working with my yarn. Um, I don't find it gets dusty this way. I know that's something a lot of other people worry about, but my yarn tends to be in motion a lot, so to speak. I run through it relatively quickly, so I haven't found that issue, even honestly with some of the stuff that does sit around for a little while. Now, beyond that, how to actually organize it inside those cubes, I try and keep all the yarns of one type together. Um, I am in a more unique position probably than a hobbyist in that I will have... I have an entire section on the back side of this wall that's with love, and it's probably, we're going to say a full nine cubes of with love. And I then I have them organized by color. So all my reds are together, all my oranges, all my yellows. But what's most important for me, and I've seen other people will mix up all their yarn. They'll have all their reds, all their oranges, all their yellows um, by color. And that probably works for them. That wouldn't work for me because if I'm making something with, say, Red Heart with Love, I want to make sure to use Red Heart with Love for all of that. So I just want to be able to go to the Red Heart with Love section. Um, the section right behind me right here, these first two, sorry about that, I just bumped the, bumped the table there. These first two sections here are almost all uh, Red Heart Scrubby Smoothie. So you can see like, ooh, I'm going to try and do this backwards. Right there, <laughs> right there are all my blues. Um, so they've gotten a little mixed up, and sometimes, like this one, if I got a bunch of one-offs, they'll all go in one cube together, but I try and keep all the same brand together, too. Um, you can see I've got my Peyton's Alpaca blend, blend sort of stacked up there, sharing a cubby with another yarn. Um, over here, all my sparklies are all my Huga charms, with a little bit of gemstone tucked in there on the side. So I do my best to keep it all super well organized, but... You know, there's definitely times, like right now I've got a little bit too much Karen Simply Soft. It's sitting in a bag on the other side of the wall. I try and get it all up on the shelf and uh, just work it out that way. I also have some shelves over here where I have, like, my current project yarn. Like, I know I need to get this one out in the next month. In terms of organizing it while I'm working with it, um, I have buckets that, depending on the size of the project, I will throw everything in, uh, in the bucket or a basket. I talk too much with my hands. I'm hitting everything today. Um, I have a lot of project bags that I'll keep each project in. Uh, one thing I do like to do, and I talked about this a little bit back before Christmas, is if I know I have a bunch of projects and I've got all the yarn and the hooks picked out and maybe, you know, a few initial notes, I will put all those things together in a project bag and then sort of almost set up my own little kits that I can run through and pick up the next one and say, I'm running to the store. It's going to be a long drive. Let's grab this one. I can get some stitches done on the way or something. Um, so, yeah, my general yarn storage is on these shelves. But my current projects are in either bags or sort of bins, 
depending on the project so I can grab and go each one. Because I do work a lot down here in the basement. That's where all my computer stuff happens, and obviously talking to you guys. When it comes time to actually crochet, I like to hit the couch. I like to go to my bedroom. I like to go someplace comfy just like everybody else. So let's see. Nancy Strand asks, do you have a tutorial on the octopus? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, right and left-handed should be coming out tomorrow morning. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you ball up your loose yarn? Uh, yes, sometimes it depends. It depends on, um, you know, I mean, if it's becoming a big mess, yeah, I'll use a yarn winder to ball it up or I might just ball it up by hand. Um, I have a couple different yarn winders I love. Um, if you're going to get just one, I really love the Stanford Needle uh, Stanford Needle Craft, something like that, yarn winder. It's on Amazon. Um, I'll put a I'll put a link up to that too. I'll get a, put a link to that at the link in the description. But my favorite one is that one because it holds like ten and a half ounces of yarn. So if you have a little bit of leftover, or you've got a big skein that needs to be wound, or a hank or whatever, um, it holds all of that. So I really love that one. And I've got I've had that one for years, and it's still running strong. Uh, let's see, Jen Deal says, what do you find is better, sitting at a table or on the sofa to work on a project? Well, it depends on the project. Um, some things are real small, delicate, and need a lot of light, um, in which case I would absolutely recommend being at a table. Um, I also find it helpful to be at a table if I've got a lot of different colors of yarn that I need to sort of keep sorted. That can be really helpful. Otherwise, generally, you know, I'm on the couch, feet up, not going to lie, sitting cross-legged, being cozy. Uh, Tiffany Smith asks, do you ever get subscription boxes? Um, I don't have a lot of subscription subscriptions. I um, love the Fix Stitches kits. Um, that's probably my favorite subscription box. Comes with a book, comes with a yarn, comes with a pattern, comes with a fun little gift. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I know the blueprint boxes are great. I personally don't subscribe to a lot of boxes simply because I don't have time to make them and that makes me sad because they're they're beautiful, they're gorgeous, um, they're absolutely fantastic. I just don't have a lot of time for, um, I guess what you'd call personal crocheting. Most of my crocheting is done for the site. Um, I really have to, you know, get all these projects out for your inspirations and for Moogly. So unfortunately I don't have a lot of spare time crocheting or knitting time. Um, so I guess really the only subscription I get regularly besides those fixed stitches stories, which I'm addicted to, is um, my Ipsy subscription, so. Afraid not, but there are some great ones out there. And I have always said when I've got, you know, when I retire and I've got all my free time, that's when I get to enjoy everybody else's patterns. So I'm really looking forward to checking those out then. Let's see. Um, how many projects do you have going at any given time? You know, it's funny. I, in general, I'll have lots of ideas. I'll have lots of things lined up. Like I have a list right now. I know what my next 10 projects are going to be. But in terms of actually working on them, I usually only have one or two. Um, I like to have something small and then if especially if I've got something bigger going on to sort of take a break and go back and forth with um, but generally speaking if I've got an idea I've got to get it out of my head I'm going to make that straight on through um, I really love one it's one of the things I love about the Moogly Crochet Along is that it's typically you know a one evening project making a 12 inch square and I do get to sit back and relax and follow somebody else's uh, somebody else's instructions for for once so to speak um, about twice a month I get to sort of mentally take the evening off and just follow their instructions, which is really enjoyable. So, <clears throat> excuse me, let's see. Um, what is Fix Stitches? It is Fix Stitches. Difficult to say. Let me take a little sip of my coffee here while I write it out so I can make it make sense here. It is a subscription service, fixstitches.com. There we are. Fic as in fiction stitches. So, excuse me, if you go to that site, you can check it out. Like I say, there's stories, they're historical fiction novels, and uh, they incorporate crochet right in the story. So there's always a pattern to go along with it, pulled from the story itself, as well as the yarn to make it, and some other fun stuff. So that's my favorite one to recommend for that. So hi, Donna and everybody else. Um, I'm gonna turn this over here. I think that is all our questions. And that leaves me with a tip I wanted to share. So if we come back down here to the table real quick, I'm gonna just go ahead and pull up this swatch where we were adding on our extra stitches on the end and pull this one out. And I noticed this, um, I've noticed this in other projects over the years, and I never gave it too much thought. But there's a lot of times when you're working with a yarn, and if you're working in the round, 
it'll even though you know you're working enough stitches like you're making double crochets and you've worked 12 double crochets in that circle it should lay flat 12 is sort of the magic number for double crochets six for single crochets nine to ten for half double crochets depending but if you make that circle and you know you've got the right hook size you've got a good enough hook size it should be nice open stitches but the hook or excuse me the circle rather is puckering like it's becoming a cone or maybe becoming a ball it's because this top loop at the end of each stitch, when you finish a stitch, you've got a loop left on your hook, right? That then becomes the top V of the next stitch. When you make that next stitch, that top loop becomes that V. When you are working with a highly textured yarn, like Bernat Blanket, and that's typically when I've seen this problem, it is very easy to pull through that last loop here. I'm just gonna pull this one out. Pull through that last loop and just sit right there on top of your stitch, even if, even pull down a little bit and that keeps that loop really really tight and that can make this top loop a little bit narrower almost than the base of the stitch itself so if you're working with a textured yarn and you find that your circles just aren't laying flat try giving a little extra tug to that top loop every time before you make the next stitch I'm just gonna work into the side of here, this here randomly don't you love that about crochet you can just stick your hook anywhere and make another stitch and you can see the top of that loop then lies, is really nice and even with the width of the rest of the stitch. So before that, make that next one then, I would just give that little, little extra tug. You don't want to pull it up too tall. You don't want it to be loose. If I pulled it up great big and tall like that, then as I make that stitch, that's going to be a really loose sloppy stitch. We don't want that. You just want to make sure to give it that little extra tug. Otherwise, it's really easy for the tops of those stitches to become too tight and cause your circle to pucker in or to bowl up. So that is my little tip for working with Bernat Blanket and other textured yarns. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that is about it for today. Thank you so much, Ashley, for your kind comments and Chris for helping out and Nancy and Cheryl and Anne and Tiffany and everybody else who's tuned in today. I think I've covered all your questions. I'm going to just sort of scroll up and make sure I didn't miss anything but it looks like it I think I covered them all like I say if you have any more questions if you didn't catch this live if you're watching it later uh, please do leave a comment on the video um, not in the chat um, I think when we finish the live the chat should go away so leave a question in the comments or email it to me Tamara Kelly at mooglyblog.com Hit the contact me button on mooglyblog.com um, and you might get your question answered in the next live. Um, well, the very next live, I will be demonstrating something very cool, um, a reader request. I've had a request for a Nostapin, how to wind a Nostapin. Um, it's a fun, uh, slightly more unusual yarn tool, but I have a couple of them in my stash, so I'll be demonstrating that on our next YouTube live. Um, but then after that, the first one, of course, in April will be Ask Me Anything Again. So I'll be back with your questions, answering them live, and of course, making my own list of questions that you've asked elsewhere as well. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you guys. Um, I do have one last question I wanted to tackle here. It came in right here last minute. Terry Redmond says, do you a lot of, since you do a lot of crocheting, any suggestions for a hand wrist? Um, I would say first thing to do, Take a break once in a while. Do your stretches um, on some couple past lives. I've definitely demonstrated some stretches. Um, and if you wanted to get the little gloves, they do sell typically little gloves at your local Joanne or Michaels uh, that you can try before you try anything more severe. But other than that, do rest. Um, try switching up your hold, your hold if you need to. Always stretch. Take breaks. Um, just like anything else, stretching and breaks are important. Um, and if you find yourself getting sore and tense in general, another good tip would be to put a pillow on each side of you before you start crocheting so you have a place to sort of rest your elbows. Uh, it helps support the arms a little bit more, take some tension off the shoulders, might not help with wrists specific, uh, specifically, but overall should make crocheting more comfortable and less sore for you. So thank you again so much, and I will see you guys again soon. Have a great day, everybody, and don't forget to go to the link in the description. Bye.